Holy fuck, it's hot outside. It's Welcome to Nuked Radio. This is episode 110. Today is Thursday, April 25th, 2013. I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is Noki Travers from Radwatch.info on Facebook. Hi, Noki. Hi, everybody. Busy, busy. Busy, busy. Certainly are. I think we're going to hold off on your rad report for a moment because we wanted to start off with a clip from James Corbett about the war on terror. Jules, do we have that queued up? Uh, no, because you didn't say you wanted it queued up at the beginning, but if <laughs> I can look for it, I'll get it for you, sure. Okay, I can drop it to you again in a minute. Well, I guess, Noki, go ahead then and give the rad report. Oh, I'm looking at the picture of the whole United States right now, and if you go to my Facebook page, radwatch.info or uh, Rad Chick Research and Mitigation, you can see that there was some unusual wave activity, what we call it yesterday in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, for yet again another day, probably five or six days a week. It's like a roller, the radiation background is like a roller coaster. But the guy's got a really nice Geiger counter. I mean, his setup is cherry. So all this data we're getting out of this Grand Rapids, Minnesota site is right on. And it doesn't happen anywhere else in the country or that I have access to every day, almost. So I'm, I'm thinking it's kind of a, a bus stop for the jet stream coming over from Fook, and that over the last couple of years from Seattle, across Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and then over to you, Rad Chick. Now, she's getting some hits today, and it is a little spiky in Michigan. But actually, we've all seen a relief from an elevated level that we had. So we're, the whole country's doing a little better. But uh, I got some high numbers all over the place. People with backgrounds of over 50 counts per minute. And that should be a concern, should be a health concern. And uh, pretty soon, that's going to be a good looking number if we don't. Watch out and be good children. Yeah, I went out a little while ago to get the mail, and it was kind of drizzling, so I took a rain swipe. And um, my my background is steady, like between 40 and 66 this morning. Mm. And that's I was getting like 60 off the rain swipe. I thought I'd get higher, but... Um, it's it's pretty high for the for the background here, and I mean, there's no fluctuation. It's staying steady. I I think because you have a lakes surrounding your state, nowhere to go. The marine layer uh, moderates your radiation. That's why we use water to moderate our nuclear fuel. Yeah, our humidity so, right now is 87%. Yeah, so when you start getting a lot of water in the atmosphere, it actually affects your ability to detect the decays, and it moderates the decays. So I am uh, i haven't seen it clear out, Christina, and um, I was much more worried about you guys about a week ago. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, a week ago, Grand Rapids was taking a break. Now they're kicking back up. And I, for me, when I see a wave pass through Seattle, Washington, my whole uh, system goes into watch mode. So I did see one last week, and I've been waiting. And where the upper part of the country is really high, and then uh, coal country, which is like, not the eastern seaboard, but like on the other side of the mountains, there the valleys of Kentucky and West Virginia. It's lots of radon and uranium and coal. And of then we get down to Georgia, and you got your Savannah River plant right there in Tennessee, and that's probably one of the hottest areas in the whole world, right there. Yeah. So, uh, how's yeah, Jules doing? It's interesting to zoom in on the geography and see exactly. Uh, Potter blog kind of clued me into that, and then Loren has to mm-hmm. to um, always zoom in, get a closer look at, at what the uh, geography is like, and just knowing how um, 
how the air moves and, and using these different wind maps and, and so forth to see if you are getting deposition. And I know that happens a lot in Salt Lake. They get the inversions because of the mm -hmm. Wasatch range. And, you know, I have a, a daughter that lives there, so I'm always keeping an eye on that area, too. I think Jules has that clip ready for us. It has been observed that the war on terror is unwinnable. After all, how could a war on an abstract noun ever have its mission accomplished moment? It is, according to this wisdom, meant to drag on forever. Just because a war can't be won, however, doesn't mean it can't be lost. The truth is that the war on terror is over, and America has lost. Just look at the images of the Watertown lockdown, a city under a supposedly voluntary lockdown that was in fact enforced by bands of roving SWAT team members going door to door, forcibly removing people from their own homes at gunpoint. Whatever the use of the word voluntary might mean in this case, I defy anyone to differentiate these images from a martial law scenario. And yet, amazingly, the media does not show us images of enraged Bostonians. It does not interview those who were treated this way by the SWAT teams. It does not ask those people directly affected what they think or report on dissent. Instead, we are shown images of mindless celebrations orchestrated to the score of that age-old chant of the mob that has lost all capacity to reason critically. USA! 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 Surely it is a mob far under the hypnotic spell of the mainstream fear programming that can cheer the destruction of their own rights. It is even more perverse that this destruction is being done in the name of two bumbling college-age boys who, it must be stressed, have yet to be proven guilty of anything. The irony seems to be lost on much of the American population that scenes like these are precisely what the all-pervasive terrorist boogeymen supposedly want. A people so enslaved by the fear of their own shadow that the actions of two hapless misfits can cause such chaos and the disruption of so many people's lives. This irony is certainly not lost on a government that has tried its utmost to make people afraid of the so-called terrorist threat over the past decade. If you see something suspicious in the parking lot or in the store, say something immediately. Report suspicious activity to your local police or sheriff. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. If you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code. Yes, the terrorists hate you for your freedom. So who are the terrorists? And who is trying to take away your freedoms? If terrorism is the use of violence to further political ends, then the real terrorists, by definition, are the ones who are ramping up the fear after each and every incident in order to shape the public's perception. Has some shadowy group of scary bearded men with turbans really caused the American population to cower in fear at the first sign of a homemade explosive anywhere in the country? Or has the government and their cronies in the media primed the population to be afraid of something that statistically is less likely to kill someone on American soil than a bee sting? In the end, the questions answer themselves. All that is needed is reflection over what we have witnessed play out over the past week. An Orwellian two minutes of hate directed not at these boys, about whom almost nothing is known except for their previous contact with the FBI, but at the ghost that has been haunting America's nightmares ever since the Bush administration conjured them into existence. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. These ghosts will continue to haunt the American population until they, and their like-minded allies around the world, choose to wake up from the nightmare. After all, you can't win a fight against a ghost. You can lose one, however. The events of the past week have proven that much. For more news and information, please follow the RSS feeds at CorbettReport.com, subscribe to this YouTube channel, or follow us on Twitter at Corbett Report. Well, I see something suspicious. Uh, the CTBT measured unusually high levels of xenon-133 and xenon-131 from April 8th to April 9th, and Vienna is saying it is due to North Korea. 
Um, I did an interview with Madison Rupert on End the Lie last Friday before the second bomber had been caught where we speculated on historical evidence of where this Boston bombing and subsequent lockdown of Boston was leading. And there were two statements um, that I made and, and Madison made that were um, proven on Monday and Tuesday. One was that more surveillance, more rules were probably going to be implemented from this event. I think that's a given. And Bloomberg had come out with this statement on Tuesday uh, that we read on the show. And I also said at some point I felt the rad levels from Fukushima might be blamed on North Korea. And so Fukushima Diary had posted this April 23rd. According to the CTBT, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty's radiation monitoring post in Tosaki, Gunma, an unusual level of a xenon-133 and xenon-131 were measured from 4.8 to 4.9. The, CP, the CTBT in Japan comments that xenon-133 has been lower than 0.64 becquerels per square meter, and xenon-131 has been lower than 0 0.21 becquerels becquerels per square meter. In the past 15 months, the detected level was unusually high. However, it has been over the normal range occasionally. On 423, the CTBT in Vienna announced the readings are due to the nuclear tests of North Korea's back in February. So that was 55 days previous. They reported this, the CTBT's radionuclear network has made a significant detection of radioactive noble gases that could be attributed to the nuclear tests announced by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea on February 12th of 2013. And at the time, you guys might remember, there was actually a seismic event recorded, I believe it was a 5-6, that clued us into the underground detonation. In fact, the CTBT reported on it at that time because they have seismic monitors all over the world to look for these types of detonations. Remember, we did one in the U.S. back in fall of last year. The detection was made in Japan, located about 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles from the DPRK test site. Lower levels were picked up at another station in Russia. Two radioactive isotopes of the noble gas xenon were identified, which provide reliable information on the nuclear nature of the source. Interesting, this was picked up in Japan and Russia 55 days after this detonation. I mean, this, this is total BS. Um, it's, this has already gone around the world once. It could have left the universe in 55 days. <laughs> So here they go, blaming stuff on North Korea. I mean, you know they're going to they're gonna do this occasionally. And look at how much it's dropped out of the news in the last two weeks. After the bombing, you don't even hear about Nor North Korea anymore. And, you know, what really gets me about this is everybody going crazy over the fact that they can refine uranium, enrich uranium for nuclear warheads. We have known about this since 2008 when there were images published, satellite images published of their uranium processing facility. This is nothing new. And we have uranium processing facilities all over the U.S. They have them in Russia. They have them in Japan. So um, if you guys haven't checked out that interview from End the Lie yet, I posted it at the top of the hour in chat, and I'll post it again. There was an Another interesting story that was published in Forbes. Fracking truck sets off a radiation alarm at a landfill. A truck carrying drill cuttings from a hydraulic fracturing pad in the Marcellus Shale was rejected by a Pennsylvania landfill on Friday after it set off a radiation alarm, according to published reports. The truck was emitting gamma radiation from radium-226 at almost 10 times the level permitted at the landfill. Now, we've done some speculation of our own that some of these rad levels that we see in Minnesota and Wisconsin could be from the radon in the ground there because it's known for that um, in their soil. And it, because it's downwind of all these fracking and drilling sites in the Dakotas. That's right.
could be part of the ra the radium could be uh, causing these waves that I'm seeing even. Yeah, but this was in Pennsylvania. The cuttings in the truck were found to emit 96 uh -huh. microrem of radiation in the landfills required to reject materials that emit more than 10. And, of course, the level is far below the EPA standard for air pollution. <laughs> Radium-226 is a naturally occurring radioactive material that forms from the decay of uranium-238. It emits alpha and gamma radiation, and it tends to accumulate in bone if inhaled or ingested. According to the EPA, long-term exposure to radium increases the risk of developing several diseases. Inhaled or ingested radium increases the risk of developing such diseases as lymphoma, bone cancer, and diseases that affect the formation of blood, such as leukemia and aplastic anemia. These effects usually take years to develop. External exposure to radium's gamma radiation increases the risk of cancer to, of varying degrees in all tissues and organs. Radium is also a well-known contaminant in fracking operations, particularly in the Marcellus Shale Formation. And Pennsylvania claims to be the only state that requires thorough regulation that landfills monitor for radiation levels in the incoming wastes. I didn't know that. Should waste trigger or radiation monitor, the landfill must use a conservative and highly protective protocol that DEP developed to determine if the amount and concentration of the radioactive material can be accepted. This protocol ensures that the material, such, such as Marcellus Shale drill cuttings and other sources of naturally occurring radiation in the waste stream, do not pose a risk to public health during disposal. So how do they dispose of it? Um, the article actually doesn't say then what happens when it sets off these alarms. So I'll drop this into chat for you guys. Pretty crazy. And some other crazy things that we've had going on is that we had uh, another explosion, actually seven. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. In Mobile, Alabama. Did you listen to the live stream the live feed of this last night on Broadcastify mm. as it was happening? No, I was watching Rachel Maddow diss the conspiracy theorists. Oh, from the MSNBC, uh, Microsoft, and GE-owned network? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah no. so she came out uh, punching with both hands on anybody who can consider that our government might possibly 9-11 right on through that that... Our government doesn't do things like that. Oh, no, of course not. So that's where I was, but I did, my YouTube feed picked up the two guys that were in the hotel room that thought it was the Carnival Cruise that blew up before yeah. before it got really happening and they realized, no, there was a whole bunch of pure raw gasoline. So did you hear those guys say that right before the explosion, it sounded like planes were dropping bombs? Uh, no, nah, because I'd have to go back to the beginning of it. To listen. I, I have that. It's posted on the Ratchet page. It is, huh? Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's there's been all kinds of interesting witness statements with the fertilizer plant explosion. In fact, one of the um, video feeds that we ran concurrent with, I think it was show 109, the, the last explosion show that we did, um, the, the audio, this guy is, is driving up to the fertilizer plant explosion, and he gets out uh -huh. of his car with his cell phone, you know, camera running, right? and he's asking people what happened, because there's so much devastation, even though he lives in the area, he yeah. can't tell where he is. Right, right. And well, hey, that street corner is not there anymore. Everybody's telling him that a plane crashed uh -huh. at this plant. And, you know, you listen to the audio from that. I mean, you can see this huge ignition that l looks like it's coming in from the left, the direction that the, the winds way are blowing. Bi way bigger than these barges, but uh, that, that was still a nice blow nonetheless. Yeah. And so, you know... This port, this explosion that happened at the port in, in Mobile, Alabama, and the interesting thing is, once again, RT was all over this story last night. They were posting updates at least a half an hour before any of the major, other major new networks were. 
and right. they, there actually were seven blasts. In fact, this is from the, the most recent article, a series of seven large blasts on a fuel barge in Mobile, Alabama, rocked the area Wednesday night, critically injuring three. An evacuation zone was set up after firefighters were unable to put, put out the blaze. They actually had everybody move back, and they were going to just let it burn out, burn itself out. And as, I don't know if it was the mayor or the fire chief, this guy was being interviewed, and he said, everything is under control, and that's exactly how he said it. And just as he says that, there's another explosion. Right, right. An hour and later, another. another one. And I'm thinking about that Texas City. 40 minutes, back, another one. How all these people came in to film while that was going on, and there was, you know, another another huge explosion. So the first thing I do is I pull up a map, and I look, how close is any of this happening to a new plant? And Waterford was actually the closest, which is uh, right next to New Orleans, uh -huh. uh, which was like 78 miles away. So it's like, okay, we're all right there. Now, where are the fertilizer plants? Around? Are there any fertilizer plants around this port? You know, what, what else is there? And any major ports like this, with all these anti-terrorism, um, you know, procedures that we have in place, there should be all kinds of security cameras of that port. So where's oh, the yeah. feeds? The only feeds that are posted are the ones that the, the news organizations took from the area while the explosions were happening and the fire was going on. So where, right. where's the feeds? The harbor the master didn't supply us with any footage, apparently. They don't have high cameras looking down on all the boats that have all these uh, high-level explosives. There's no way to put out 20,000 gallons of burning gasoline. There's nothing, there's no way to do it. Yeah, RT is reporting that several barges in the area are carrying um, a couple hundred gallons of gasoline still. The air is still pretty hot. The explosion took place on two barges in the Austral shipyard. The Mobile Fire and Rescue Department reported the vessels were transporting natural gas and were believed to be partially emptied, according to Steve Huffman, a Mobile Fire Rescue spokesman. Um, there's a, some really great images, some high-definition images of that natural gas explosion. Oh, my gosh. It's pretty crazy. I guess they felt it like 10 miles away. And I know that, um, you know, it, it takes months of investigation to piece these events together by people that are highly trained. And the thing that's so concerning, though, is that with some of these, um, these reports from eyewitnesses that, you know, and then you hear the audio from the fertilizer plant explosion, it sounds like an incoming missile. I mean, you listen to it. Listen to it right before I watched mission. that video. It looked like something flew into the place just yeah. before it blew up. So, you know, we uh, have this fertilizer plant explosion. Now the, the mobile barges. And who's going to be doing all the investigating? Well, government agencies will be the ones conducting these investigations. There, Which there leads back people. to, you know, James, James's report <laughs> that we just played. Who are the real terrorists? We know that the government lies about radiation. I think that's pretty evident at this point. <laughs> it's pretty hard to refute because they change their numbers even after they've already published them. So. Yeah. And another article that came out because of the anniversary of the BP disaster, which was April 20th, this appeared in uh, Newsweek yeah. on the 22nd. What BP doesn't want you to know about the 2010 golf spill. It's as safe as Dawn dishwashing liquid. That's what Jamie Griffin says the BP man told her about the smelly Rainbow Street gunk coating the floor of the floating hotel where Griffin was feeding hundreds of cleanup workers during the BP oil disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. Apparently the workers were tracking the gunk inside on their boots Griffin, as chief cook and maid, was trying to clean it, but even boiling water didn't work. The <laughs> BP representative said, Jamie, just mop it up like you'd mop any other dirty floor. 
It was the opening weeks of what everyone, echoing President Barack Obama, was calling the worst environmental disaster in American history. At 9.45 p.m. local time on April 20, 2010, a fiery explosion on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig had killed 11 workers and injured 17. One mile underwater, the Macondo well had blown apart, unleashing a gusher of oil into the Gulf. At risk were fishing areas that supplied one-third of the seafood consumed in the U.S., beaches from Texas to Florida that took billions of dollars worth of tourism to local economies and Obama's chances of re-election. Republicans were blaming him for mishandling the disaster. His poll numbers were falling. Even his 11-year-old daughter was demanding, Daddy, did you plug the hole yet? Griffin did as she was told. I tried pine saw, bleach, I even tried Dawn on those floors as she scrubbed the mix of cleanser and gunk occasionally splashed on her arms and face. Within days, the 32-year-old single mother was coughing up blood and suffering constant headaches. She lost her voice. My throat felt like I had swallowed razor blades, she said. Then things got much worse. Like hundreds, possibly thousands of workers on the cleanup, Griffin soon fell ill with a cluster of excruciating, bizarre, and grotesque ailments. By July, unstoppable muscle spasms were twisting her hands into immovable claws. In August, she began learning her, losing her short-term memory. And after cooking professionally for 10 years, she couldn't remember the recipe for vegetable soup. One morning, she got in her car to go to work, only, discovered, only to discover she hadn't put on pants. The right oh side... God but only the right side of her body started acting crazy. It felt like the nerves were coming out of my skin. It was so painful. My right leg swelled, my ankle would get as wide as my calf, and my skin got incredibly itchy. These were the same symptoms experienced by soldiers who returned from the Persian Gulf War with Gulf War Syndrome. This is Michael Robichow, a Louisiana physician and former state senator who treated Griffin and 113 other patients with similar complaints. As a general practitioner, Robichaw said he had never seen this grouping of symptoms together, skin problems, neurological impairments, plus pulmonary problems. Only months later, after Kai Kilborn, a former professor of medicine at the University of Southern California and one of the nation's leading environmental health experts, came to Louisiana and tested 14 of his patients, did the two physicians make the connection with Gulf War Syndrome, the malady that affects an estimated 250,000 veterans of that war with a mysterious combination of fatigue, skin inflammation, and cognitive problems. Meanwhile, the well kept hemorrhaging oil. The world watched with bated breath as BP failed in one attempt to, after another to stop the leak. An agonizing 87 days passed before the well was finally plugged on July 15th. By then, 210 million gallons of Louisiana sweet crude had escaped into the Gulf of Mexico, according to government estimates, making the BP disaster the largest accidental oil leak in world history. Three years later, the BP disaster has been largely forgotten, both overseas and in the U.S. The media has moved on, and today the only business press offers serious coverage of what the Financial Times call, calls the trial of the century, the trial is now underway in New Orleans, where BP faces tens of billions of dollars in potential penalties for the d disaster. As for Obama, the same president who early in the BP crisis blasted the scandalously close relationship between oil companies and government regulators, two years later ran for re-election, boasting about how much new oil and gas development his administration had approved. And now his investigators will be the ones conducting the investigation on the fertilizer plant explosion and this newest explosion in Mobile, Alabama. That wraps it up in a neat package for me. Really terrible, and you don't hear about these poor, this poor people. This poor she she wasn't an, even an oil worker. She's just feeding people. Yeah, I talked to a lawyer recently with the Stuart Smith group in New Orleans about the, I had called him actually about the sinkhole and we ended up having this really long conversation about BP and um, all the radiation problems and the TEPCO lawsuit and, you know, for, for um, a formation of maybe a coalition of attorneys that could prosecute nuclear crimes. And they actually don't have any real involvement with the sinkhole situation. 
because he said it's too expensive for them to take on individual cases. They can only afford to prosecute these cases if they come in the form of a class action lawsuit. And there are already a few attorneys that are handling this. In fact, I have the name of one of them in the New Orleans area, and then the second one is the Brockovich firm. So they have two groups of these class action um, lawsuits going on about the sinkhole situation. And um, his law firm actually handles most of the stuff from BP. And as far as the nuclear stuff goes, he was just like, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, you have to, you, this would be such a huge undertaking. And the really big problem is getting expert witnesses. And, you know, what, what Loren has told me, too, about this whole Rocketdyne thing is Chris Busby helped in a class action lawsuit, which resulted in $230 million being paid out to 20 families who lived around Rocketdyne. Uh-huh, right. Had kids I was unaware of that. Severe cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nobody knows about that because they didn't want to um, set a precedent, so they settled out of court. Right, make them sign a piece of paper. After Chris Busby found that there were short-lived isotopes in L.A.'s drinking water, <laughs> which could only mean that there's an active reactor running in the vicinity, which Rocketdyne isn't even supposed to have anymore because the NRC took their license away like 10 years ago. It's so, as safe as, as Don dishwashing liquid, okay? Well, I know all these excuses to kind of start, like, running together, don't they? <laughs> yeah, the floating hotel, we call it now, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so there's, there's, almost, there's, like, no words even to, like, describe how... I mean, Tep, Tep, didn't TEPCO just say they're not responsible for cleaning up anything now, period? Anything that lands outside of their property. The, the, anything past the cyclone fence becomes the responsibility of the property owners. All right. So there's what your industry is going to do for you. Okay. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, you know, uh, I, I, we used to be on these health kicks back in the day, and we get really healthy. And now I see people being more like health, Recovery experts mm-hmm. or detoxification, and we know this is invisible. If the next time you go see your family physician, and I know mm-hmm. you and I have been <laughs> sick lately, um, you know, try ask them if they know what the multiplier effect is. I I bet you they won't, or they they will in some other way that relates to pharmacology, and. Well. You know, I'm, I'm talking about radiation plus chemicals, and we are being exposed to just loads of right, it everywhere. Exactly. And, you know, yesterday I found out a good friend of mine um, might have breast cancer. She's got an egg, a um, tumor in her breast the size of an egg. She's oh. under 40. And um, two mm. weeks before that, one of my friends called me, her son, who's 17, just had to have some of his lymph nodes removed. His lymph nodes were blowing up all over the place like mine. They live in Michigan. This other it's girl with Michigan. breast cancers in Michigan. And you These know I know all that environmental. Our, I know that our rads are high. We've had all kinds of oil spills, the Enbridge thing that you know, Ann Arbor had a huge spill. Now we have flooding, all these people coming down with sickness. And um, and then if you're flying on top of it and you're getting exposed to high radiation in the air, oh, my gosh, how can you even stay healthy anymore? And you go to your doctors, all they want to do is put you on medications, which just makes you more sick. Well, when you say talk to your doctor about radiation, <laughs> it's like, no, educate your doctor about radiation. Right. You're immediately flagged for, like, Valium. Yeah, you exactly. Know. You're, psych- you're psychotic. If you're fixating on, uh, there's you know, there's no. I I heard a good term used last night about people that ask ask too many questions of their doctors. <laughs> it's wow. called pharmacological deletion. You're immediately placed on medications to make you think less. Think about that. Yeah. Pharmaceut- pharmaceutical deletion. 
Um, well, speaking of other environmental disasters, uh, Hanford has been in and out of the news. Leaking nuclear material at Hanford was white, now yellow or light green. The amount has increased measurably. Expert says this waste actually gets worse as time goes on. This was a follow-up report that was done on King 5 of Seattle. The leak assessment team estimated in October of 2012 that between, uh, let's see here, 190 and 520 gallons of waste had leaked into the annulus of A1-102. Last week, Washington River Protection Solutions media representatives Jerry Holloway and John Britton repeated those exact numbers to King TV when asked how much had leaked so far. Holloway and Britton said that the tank was still leaking, but there had been no appreciable change since last year. In addition, they wrote, a significant portion of the liquid has evaporated, <laughs> which gives you the, the false sense of security that it's disappeared, leaving about 20 to 50 gallons of drying waste. But King 5 has obtained documents written this month by Washington Department of Ecology's Michelle Hendrickson stating that the amount of waste has increased by a measurable amount. The area within the annulus that waste occupies has increased approximately 25% since Ecology's visit to the tank farm on December 27th of 2012. This area increased vertically and horizontally where it extends outward in finger channels and near the smaller piece of what appears to be orange insulation foam, wrote Hendrickson in an April 3rd letter. The edges of the waste material are very wet and are changing color. The waste material was white, which indicated dry waste, and it's now yellow or light green. I wonder if uh, um, th that's Biden's you know anywhere with that. They just talk about the colors of this stuff because they have no idea what combinations they're in anymore. Yeah, they're just reporting on the color change. <laughs> and always so, some of it evaporated, you know. Right. Well, and of course that just you know disappeared. We they're not accountable for it because it's gone. How many decades has it been going on over there at Hand? At Hanford? Yeah. Yeah. They, they they go back 60 years, 70 years. Is it 60 years? Yeah. Well, didn't I they do some Manhattan? They they had something to do, uh, I thought, with early Manhattan, but maybe I'm Yeah, wrong. they had, I think, nine reactors at the height of their yeah, I mean, production, and they were specifically for plutonium production. <laughs> And then the plutonium was shipped across the country to Pantex, right? where it was assembled into bombs. And now, of course, Pentex says all they do is disassemble bombs. Now they just do it in reverse. Yeah, yeah. So, but you have to link Hanford and then, the t and then uh, in Tennessee, Oak Ridge, and then the Savannah River, and then, of course, Los Alamos. And... Uh, I I don't really know Idaho. how many manufacturing sites you know how many yeah how many are gone you know don't don't forget about Idaho in fact we're gonna um we're gonna read an article from a woman who lived around Idaho but it's actually for the Chernobyl Good. anniversary which is tomorrow so right it'll be the twenty seventh anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster. And um, Libby Halevi of Nuclear Hot Seat has a great interview that she did, which will air today immediately following Nuked Radio. And tomorrow on the Rad Chick page, we will be posting videos, pictures, and worthwhile documents and documentaries all day to honor the anniversary, and especially for the people that are still living with that disaster today. Um, I had one other report, too, from Japan that I wanted to, actually two reports from Japan. One was from Gigi, April 24th. Tamura, a city about 20 kilometers west of the new plant that was originally in a no-go zone, was moved to the sub-20 millisievert zone in April of 2012 and is recovering quickly. The ban on vegetable shipments from Tamura was lifted last month making it the first no-go zone to receive the green light for sales. Residents and agricultural co cooperatives in the city said that at least two farms are preparing to plant rice and others are planning to grow feed grain. They should probably be planting hemp. 
because that would help decontaminate their soil. But uh, even with all of those efforts, I find it um, pretty upsetting that they're going to be growing vegetables in that area and probably shipping it off to schools to feed uh, kids to show how safe it is. Fukushima Diary also reported on the 23rd that there was a sign of possible Mount Fuji activity. There was a large landslide there. Uh, let's see, it's 70 meters wide and 80 meters long. 22 people uh, and six households were told to evacuate two days before the landslide when they found a ground crack that was 150 meters long. The width increased on 422. The location is in Tenku Hamatsu City in the area west of Mount Fuji. The land is actually a tea plantation. And this was an area recently that they had a strong alkaline detection in their water and a mass death of fish in uh, a river near there as well. So there could be some uh, volcanic emissions. Sometimes that's a way of determining when a volcano is going to be erupting is the amount of alkalinity in the rivers that flow down from the mountains. So uh, there's a nice map here that was uh, posted on Fukushima Diary showing where that is in the relation to the city of Tokyo. So <clears throat> you guys make sure that you stay tuned today for Nuclear Hot Seat to listen to Libby's interview. I have an article that I want to read, and it's going to take probably the last 15 minutes of the show to read it. It's called Pawning the Chernobyl Necklace by Osha Gray Davidson. And this came out at the beginning of the Fukushima disaster. As the world gapes mesmerize at the nuclear disaster unfolding in Japan, those not at risk of exposure to the radiation bless their good luck and wonder what it, what it must feel like to be the unlucky ones, the ones who can't escape that invisible blanket of fear. Let me tell you what it feels like. On a spring day in 1975, the first words I heard as I rose through the fog of anesthetic were, it is malignant. I was 24 years old. A couple of months earlier, during a routine physical, my doctor had found a mass on my thyroid gland. X-rays and ultrasound had failed to clarify whether the mass was a fluid-filled cyst or a solid tumor. The only choice was surgery. The tissue analysis during the operation confirmed a diagnosis of thyroid cancer. The surgeon removed one lobe and the bar of the barbell-shaped gland at the base of my neck. I was informed that I'd take thyroid hormone for the rest of my life because if my own remnant gland were to start functioning again, it might grow itself another cancer. And so I've taken a little pill every morning for 36 years, and it took a long time for the screaming red scar around my neck the kind that was later dubbed the Chernobyl necklace, to fade. I was very lucky, and I can say that now after so many years without a recurrence, but it's been 36 years of ever-present fear and not a few physical problems, along with an increasing sense of outrage, as the likely cause of my trauma has gradually been revealed to me. At the time, why me was uppermost in my mind. We don't know what causes it, my doctor told me in a casual tone, but a lot of young women get thyroid cancer. Although I tried to put it behind me, I developed a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. I became terrified of my body. Every blemish triggered anxiety about new tumors, and every routine screening was a nightmare. I endured a string of significant but non-fatal health problems involving several more surgeries and biopsies. One time I asked a doctor whether having had cancer once meant I'd paid my dues. He laughed, saying the opposite was true. One cancer increases the odds of getting another cancer or of the original cancer spreading to other organs. Paying your dues early doesn't get you a free pass later. I can't say that I handled the experience well. As a young baby boomer, I was already immersed in the nihilism triggered by the long shadow of the Cold War and the white-hot rage of the Vietnam War. Whoopee, we're all going to die. And yet at the same time, because I was so young, I didn't know anybody else who was even sick, let alone a cancer victim. 
Back then, there were no cancer support groups, no proud survivors wearing colorful scarves during their chemo phases. No doctor suggested to me either that I might find a little counseling helpful. As I wandered through my 20s and early 30s, I kept an ear cocked for any information I might come across about what causes thyroid cancer. In 1986, the year of Chernobyl, I learned that the link between exposure to ionizing radiation and thyroid cancer was far and away the strongest of all of the disease's possible causes. So I began pondering how I might have been exposed to such radiation. That's when things really started to get ugly. I found an embarrassment of riches. I had grown up in kind of a nuclear triangle. Ninety miles north of my hometown was Pocatello, Idaho, the Idaho National Laboratory that squats in the desert. When I was six months old, the first nuclear-generated electricity in the world was produced there. The site has the highest concentration of reactors in the world, 52, which most are now mothballed, although no one admits to any large airborne radiation releases of radiation, at least 11 billion gallons of radioactive waste was injected into the Snake River Aquifer between 1953 and 1984. A few hundred miles to the northwest, a similar cluster of deceptively bland buildings crouches on the Columbia River basalt at Hanford, Washington. During production of the plutonium used in some of the world's first nuclear weapons, Millions of curies of iodine-131 were released to the air at Hanford. The government knew at least as early as the mid-1940s that potassium iodide was protective against 131 absorption, absorption by the thyroid. The government neglected to tell the public this or notify downwinders either ahead of time or afterward about any releases of iodine-131 from any of its facilities. In fact, the government rarely acknowledged public risk from radiation released at any of its weapons facilities around the country. When forced to, the feds instilled that there was no danger, just like the Japanese and U.S. governments are doing today. I thought the Idaho and Washington sites were the most likely places where I could have intersected with a cloud of radioactive iodine because my family had taken many vacations either in Idaho's central mountains which were reached by driving through the Idaho Nuclear Reservation, past signs warning of arrest or worse, if a motorist should stop for any reason, or in trips down to the Columbia River Highway to visit relatives in Portland. But in fact, the most likely source of that 131 lay to the southwest, the Nevada test site near Las Vegas. I knew almost nothing about the MTS, but by 1997 I had begun to learn. That year, the National Cancer Institute published a map of where the many clouds of iodine-131 had traveled from the 925 nuclear tests in Nevada between 1951 and 1963. While my county was not the hardest hit, it had definitely been hit multiple times. The National Cancer Institute exposure calculator says I probably received a total of 10 rads from 131 from iodine-131 from 47 separate tests between 1951 and 1966. A table of health effects indicates changes in the blood chemistry appear at 5 to 10 rads or REMS, but this is still considered a relatively low dose, not expected to cause acute symptoms of radiation sickness. As I gleaned more information, my resentment continued to smolder. Then in about 2004, an Idaho native named Sherry Garman decided enough was enough. Dying of thyroid cancer that had spread to her breast and liver, Sherry spent the last year or so of her life making Idahoans aware of how much fallout the state had received and making Idaho politicians push for compensation for those of their citizens whose lives had been lost, shortened, or made living hell by federal policy. Four of the five counties in the nation, in the nation hardest hit with iodine-131 are in Idaho. The top county is in Montana. Sherry Garman's hometown of Emmett, an idyllic dairy and cherry heartland gem near Boise, got most of the iodine-131 in the state. Most Idahoans had no idea they'd been exposed to so much radiation, but as the penny dropped, they rallied around Sherry and demanded the chance to tell their own stories of pain, heartbreak, and financial ruin by medical bills. 
Rage really churned up when it emerged that the NTS decision makers had routinely waited to detonate their bomb tests until the wind was blowing exactly towards Idaho. One government document characterizes people living under that plume trajectory as a low-use segment of the population. This was well known to Utah downwinders who'd understood their experience far earlier than Idahoans did. Sherry Garman lived just long enough to get a bill introduced that would make Idahoans eligible under the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act and to see her daughter graduate from high school. Seven years later, Idahoans are still waiting for the bill as it languishes in committee. Baby boomer downwinders know that politicians and policymakers are playing a waiting game. As soon as we all die off, the pressure on them to act will evaporate, unless, of course, a new co collision of natural forces and human error creates a new generation of downwinders, which is starting to look more likely as of this writing. Through this long journey, I've struggled to understand the nature of radiation risk. Between the discovery of the growth and the moment when I regained consciousness after my thyroidectomy, my ears had been filled with the voices of doctors thinking they offered comfort when they assured me that 99% of these tumors are benign. For the person that falls into that last 1%, the world's underpinnings shift. Instead of a probabilistic world where we are comfortable making decisions according to, say, the odds of a thunderstorm ruining a picnic, we are thrust into binary hell where the choices and chances are only two, win or lose, white or black, benign or malignant. Yet the innards of atoms also follow probabilistic patterns. At that scale, cause and effect cannot be linked in straight lines. No one can say just when subatomic particles will be ejected from which atom and to what amount of energy, and who will absorb how many of those particles of, or which of a person's cells will be hit by them, or whose immune system will be unable to repair the damage done by these tiny loose cannons rocketing through their tissues. Experts generally say things like, there might be X number of additional cancers in a particularly exposed population, but they cannot say who will get those cancers, a handy out when it comes to appropriating right and wrong and assigning moral accountability. The problem is converted from a concrete one affecting real human beings to an abstract one affecting nobody in particular. Most of us are fine with that sort of risk, as long as it's not us on the operating table. As the terrible news from Japan keeps breaking in ever-worsening waves, and as I sample the boiling Twitter sphere, the pontification of experts, and worse of all, the drivel spouted by government authorities, I get angry all over again. Everywhere I turn, I hear that unless radiation levels get improbably high, nobody will get sick, as if acute radiation sickness is the only consequence of exposure. Read my lips, there is no such thing as a guaranteed safe level of exposure to ionizing radiation. Certainly, distance from the source and dilution in the atmosphere lowers exposure risk. And sure, you can swallow some potassium iodide to prevent your thyroid gland from absorbing iodine-131, although it won't protect you from the cesium-137 or the strontium-90 or the plutonium. The official focus on high short-term doses is deceptive. Emerging, emerging science suggests that low doses of radiation exposure can have numerous long-term effects, possibly passed from one generation to the next. And almost all of the discussion about, and the scientific research on, radiation exposure focuses on cancers. There are certainly more, many cancers that radiation can induce in addition to thyroid cancer, from breast and prostate cancer to various leukemias. These cancers are thought to result from energetic particles striking DNA, breaking strands, and interfering with gene replication. Faulty genes lead to faulty cells is the thinking, but there also may be other genetic effects, that is, changes in the way normal genes are organized and allowed to function and these may result in disorders other than cancer, such as thyroid diseases, autoimmune problems, and hormones gone haywire. To make matters worse, how old you are when you're exposed makes a big difference, too. 
Prenatal insults, including chemical and radiation exposure, can create epigenetic patterns of gene expression that will stay with you forever, even if your actual genes are undamaged. And it can take 50 or more years for the timer set in the womb to trip the fuse and trigger a full-blown disease. In a 2009 review article, Canadian researchers Carmel Mothersill and Colin Seymour of McMaster University nicely expressed the emerging state of knowledge about the effects of low-level radiation exposure. Our understanding of the biological effects of low-level exposure has undergone a major paradigm shift. We understand, at least in part, some of, some of the mechanisms which drive low-dose effects and which perpetuate these not only in the exposed organism, but also in its progeny and, in certain cases, its kin. This means that previously held views about safe doses or lack of harmful effects cannot be sustained. I've spent a lot of time in that miserable state of anxiety where I can almost feel each invisible ray invading my body and leaving me paralyzed. This is not a useful condition to be in. I've learned to resist it in part because every minute I spend terrorized is another minute of my life paid over to the patronizing hubris of the military industrial complex. Well, if you put it that way, Jonathan, maybe I should just pack up and go home.